Okay, we're very pleased and privileged to have at the Aspen Ideas Festival Phoebe, Phoebe Novakovic, who is the chairman and CEO of General Dynamics. Now, she rarely does these kind of forums publicly because she likes to be more anonymous than a lot of her peer CEOs. So we're very pleased she decided to come here today. And this is her first time at the Aspen Ideas Festival. Let me give you a little bit of her background and then we'll go in through her life and what she's doing now as the chairman and CEO of General Dynamics. Uh, General Dynamics, I should say, is a, one of the largest aerospace defense contractors in the United States, a market capitalization of roughly $50 billion. And it is up since she became the CEO on January 1 of 2013, it's up approximately 113%. And the stock, had you bought the stock the day that she became the CEO, you would now be up 149%, a compound annual growth rate of roughly 16%. So uh, all of you should have bought that stock when she became the chairman and CEO. She is uh, somebody who grew up in many different parts of the United States because her father, a Serbian immigrant, was in the U.S. military and lived in many different places in the United States. She ultimately went to Smith College and then ultimately got a graduate degree, an MBA, at the Wharton School. Um, she's worked at, before she went to Wharton, she worked at the CIA, later came back after Wharton to work at OMB and the Pentagon, and then in 2001, she joined General Dynamics and rose up. In 2012, she became the President and Chief Operating Officer, 2013, the Chairman and CEO. So, very impressive accomplishments. So, let me ask you first. You are the CEO and Chairman of General Dynamics. There is another woman who is the Chairman and CEO of Lockheed Martin. And there's another woman who's Chairman and CEO of Northrop Grumman. Do you think that men should be given the chance to be CEOs of aerospace <laughs> defense companies? And is there no affirmative action going on in this, in this industry? Why is that? So the last remaining male, um, Tom Kennedy at, at, at Raytheon, teases that he's the last man standing and that he, you know, he needs a you know, special dispensation um, and consideration. But yes, I think, I think we're all fortunate to be in the positions we're in at the moment. And women run aerospace defense companies better than men, it seems, because the stocks are doing very well in all those companies. Would you agree with that? Well, personally, I won't speak to other people's companies, but for us, it's really about the team. Um, and, and what that team does and, and the role of the CEO is really to set the stroke strategically, it's to set the culture of the entity, it's to ensure that um, all of the players are rowing, rowing in the same direction. That's my job. Uh, okay. But it's the team that makes the money. Now, right now we have record defense budgets in the United States. So if you're the CEO of an aerospace defense company, is this a great time to be in that position? Or is there a big challenge that you're worried about? Because the US government's putting a lot of money in this area. Isn't that helping your company a bit? Or are you worried about some problem beyond the budget? So I think, you know, if you think about what the, the defense major primes, and there are only a few of them left, they are industrial conglomerates with different lines of business. And as the defense budget grows, multiple lines of their business will grow. But it is a cyclical business. And so you'll have periods that you know, sales are up, revenue is up, and, and, and periods where revenue is down, coincident with, with defense spending and the perception of the threat that drives defense spending. So in the last eight years preceding um, the most recent administration, there had been an emphasis away from um, national security spending and emphasis more on domestic spending. So what you saw was relatively flat sales during those periods. So I think it's our job and my job, this is how I think about it, is to be a good cyclical on the up and the down. So we manage the up well, that means we keep our operating discipline, and we manage the down well. Well, how do you deal with this issue? Um, the, the title of this is, deals with the moral compass to some extent. And you're producing products that could kill people. Um, do you worry about that, that you're basically in a company, like all aerospace defense companies, while we call them defense, sometimes they have to be on offense. And is this a problem that you face or your employees face that you're producing products that could ultimately someday be used to kill people? So I, I think about... Um the moral compass or, or, or morality or what we call um, ethics and ethos in two particular ways. One, when I think you're in an institution that manufactures, engineers, designs, and manufactures instruments to protect our nation but ultimately 
can be used to kill people in that service of protecting our nation and our liberty. I think you need to think very carefully about what you do. Be very mindful and intentional about what you do. And I think it's helpful to remember the, the import and the magnitude of the responsibility we have. I hope nobody from a diaper company is here, but internally I say, guys, we're not making diapers. We are making really important things, both to protect our people in the field, to preserve our nation's, our nation's security and our way of life and our constitution, but recognize these can be used to kill, and I think we need to have those kinds of conversations. So that's one element of it. But I'm also a big believer that corporations are defined by um, their culture, just in the same way that, that individuals are defined by their character, right? And a corporation is nothing but an accumulation of individuals. So when we think about culture at General Dynamics, we really talk about it in terms of our ethos. And that ethos is important to me because it is based in a fundamental moral view of the world. And, we talk, and that's intentionally how I lead. It is the culture that we have promulgated throughout the company. And it's critically important to me. At the Democratic debates the other night, uh, this issue was not raised. But there is an, uh, one of your subsidiaries is Gulfstream, which makes very good business jets. But the 650, your top of the line business jet, cannot land in Aspen. Now, is that a big problem that you're worried about? And do you get a lot of complaints about that from people that own 650s who want to land in Aspen and not land in Rifle? Is that a big problem? And, and, and you're suggesting that was not a conversation topic. That would have been raised at the <laughs> Democratic debate. Stunningly debates. enough, it was not, was it? It wasn't raised? Um, yeah, thank the Lord, actually. Um, so listen, all politics are local. And as I understand it, there may be some local issues around that. The airplane is perfectly capable of landing in, in uh, Aspen. Right. Right, so, you're so working. Um, well, I think it's best for those who live in the community to manage the political okay. realities than, <laughs> better well, than I. It's been a burning issue for me, but I'm now glad you're working on it. OK. Well, do you want to ride home? Well, I, uh, uh, I, I don't know. i got to go to Rifle, but OK. So um, <laughs> let's talk about your background a moment. Your father, um, last name, obviously, is uh, Novakovic, mm -hmm. right? It's actually Novakovic oh, really? in serbo -Croatian. So how many people pronounce it correctly? No one. No one. OK, including me, I guess, right? No, no, you know, you got it. Um, in fact, it's, it, it's, got, it's gotten to the point now where, and I don't have the hubris or arrogance to think that I'm known by one name, but in fact, in my little tiny you know, world, you know, there's only one Phoebe. Um, so you're I, like, I think I, I bet you 85 to 90 percent of the employees don't ha know how to say. So it's name. like Madonna, Cher, isn't it and though? Phoebe. Yes. Right. <laughs> you don't need a last name. Okay. It's very similar, wouldn't you say? Exactly. Um, in many ways, um, their internal rates of return are not as high as yours, though. So. Um, let's oh God, let's hope there are lots of other distinctions, okay. not so, just that. So anyway. Your father came from Serbia, and did he was he escaping a war, or did he come over? Why did he come over? So his family was caught between the two wars, uh, the two armies, in the Axis armies and the Allied armies. And frankly, that all six of them survived was the testimony to strength, willpower, fortitude. And, they had, and their dream was to come to the United States. And frankly, they were rescued by the United States. And did he speak English when he came over? No. He spoke seven languages and not English. And what did he do when he got here? So he worked. Um, he worked. He got whatever jobs they could get, menial jobs. And these had been very well-educated people. Um, but one of the jobs he got was to run internal mail at, with a predecessor of J.P. Morgan. It was 45 floors. So he ran up and down every day um, delivering mail. OK. And uh, was your mother from Serbia as well? No. She's all American. All American. OK. 57. So uh, they're both alive. They are. They must be pretty proud. Uh, when you became the chairman and CEO of General Dynamics, what did they say? Well, perhaps they were a bit stunned. Um, but once they got through that, they're desperately proud. And, and I think what they saw is, um, in retrospect now, they can, they'll relay that you know, some of these characteristics of strength and fortitude um, were apparent as a young child. It seems to me I got punished for them. But, um, so they're very quick to regale that these were characteristics that they 
All right, so your father moved around the United States because he was in the and US military. And Europe. Europe. So you ultimately went to high school where? Where did you graduate from high school? Well, um, I went to lots of high schools. But, but you I oh, from one of them, yeah, right? Yeah, I did. Um, from San Antonio, Texas. I'd never been south of really the Mason Dixon border because Northern Virginia doesn't count. We were there for a while. Okay, so, so you the, graduated from San Antonio and then you went to Smith College? Right. And why did you pick Smith? Well, um, I thought that I um, had outgrown high school, I think, personally, and, and I thought that I would do well. I thought, why don't I try to apply myself intellectually? Right. Um, so that was a lot of work. All right, so you graduated but from... I, I got through it. What did you think, you, when you graduated from Smith, what did you think you were going to do? Well, what I hoped was get a job. You know, when you when you graduate, even back in the um, you know in the in the late seventies when I graduated uh, with a liberal arts degree, unless you were going to law school, which didn't particularly interest me, um, the career paths were not clear. I mean, the value that a liberal arts education brings to the table is r really evident. I think the further you move up like any food chain and leadership change. Chain and so I, I rely heavily, frankly, on all the learning um, okay. that I had at the time. Now in this job, so, so when you graduated, I just needed Smith, a job. The job you you chose not to pursue the highest calling of mankind, private equity, right? I know it was it was a mistake. <laughs> okay, you chose to go to work for the U.S. government mm -hmm. at the CIA. I did. Can you tell us the things you worked on there? No, and and I'll, but I will tell you why. Um, I, um, and I'm very open about this, I am um, a great believer in our nation, and I believe that it's important to serve our nation. And I felt that uh, having spent a lot of time overseas in Europe in the height of the Cold War, I had a very se clear sense of both the fragility of American security but as well as the importance of America and the world, and I wanted to do something to serve. And since I didn't do particularly well in a, in a hierarchical bound uh, organization, so the military wasn't necessarily for me, I thought this was... Okay, so you went to the CIA, and then after a while you decided to go to Wharton and get an MBA. Mm -hmm. All right, so after you graduated from Wharton, you have an MBA, you graduated from Smith, you worked in the CIA, did you get lots of job offers, people who wanted you? None. None. So, and that was challenging because I had children at the time and I ended up being unemployed. Um, I sent out 50 resumes. I got one call that said, you're overqualified. I got another call that said, well, you have no relevant experience. That's a, that, you know, we're judged in life not on how we, how we handled the good times, but on how we handled the difficult times. And do you think any of these were because you're a woman or not? No, I think it's because I had a fairly eclectic background and that you had to take a chance on me. All right, so you ultimately got a job at the Office of Management and Budget, which is in control of the U.S. budget. What was your job at the Office of Management and Budget? So I uh, was fortunate enough to fairly quickly rise up the ranks, and I ended up um, running the defense, or the, the element of the budget that put the president's uh, funding plan in place for all of national security, which includes intel and defense. Okay. Did you ever meet the president of the United States? Then, yes. Who was the president when you were dealing president with? President Clinton. President Clinton, okay. So was he interested in defense? Yes, actually. Increasingly so as the term went on. I think the more that he understood the criticality of, okay. of our role in the world. All right, so you did that for a while, and then you went to the Pentagon. Um, how did you get that job, and what was your job at the Pentagon? So I've always loved the military. Um, I think that they are really our arsenal of freedom in many regards. And so I, uh, it was an opportunity to work at the senior levels of the Pentagon. I was the chief of staff to, um, to the number two guy there, and uh, it was a great experience. Were there a lot of women in senior positions at the Pentagon then? None. None. Nor were there women in, in uh, OMB particularly. So, okay. so you're doing this for a number of years, and then in 2001. Or in the CIA, I might add. There's a theme here. <laughs> in 2001, you, get, you decide to go to work at uh, General Dynamics. What propelled you to leave the Pentagon to go to General Dynamics, and how did you get that job? So I had met most of the CEOs of the various companies. Um, I thought that General Dynamics, well, General Dynamics was run uh, at the time by a, um, 
a lawyer. I thought he was a superb CEO, and I thought, well, there, there's a rather, that, that may be a more iconoclastic organization, and a, and a person like me who has a little bit different background might find a place. And you know, as we've, you and I have talked before, so much in life is about finding your place. And, and I was fortunate enough to find my place. So you went there, and when you joined, did you say, you know, in 12 years, I'm going to be the CEO? No. And had, you know what? I have a real belief. If anybody thinks that, they're doomed to fail. Right. I, I've had a philosophy that you do the job in front of you to the best of your ability. You play well in the sandbox. You work very, very hard, and you put the team above yourself, and that's how you get ahead. Were there a lot of women in, at General Dynamics then in senior positions? No, there was never a line at the ladies' room. Really? <laughs> okay. So um, you rose up, and, let, and now you preside over this company. As I said, it's done quite well since you've been running it. Let's talk about the parts of the company that, that you have. So one of them I referred to earlier, which is your aerospace business. That's basically, you, uh, your company bought Gulfstream many years ago, yes. and it uh, turned out to be a spectacular acquisition. Is that right? It was. So if somebody is sitting yes. here, and they say, I want to buy a corporate jet, I could buy a Falcon, I could buy a Bombardier product, or I could buy a Gulfstream. Why should they buy Gulfstream? So we are the only manufacturer and provider of business aviation that has all new clean sheet airplanes. And when I say clean sheet, that means new fuselage, new engines, new cockpit, new cabin, new technology. And what is, why did we do that? To drive performance. We go faster and farther than anybody. We have an ambient um, temperature or air pressure in the cabin that's 1,000 feet less than anybody else. You know why you like that? Because you arrive where you're going a lot faster and you arrive there refreshed. The engines are more efficient. The cockpits are safer. The whole airplane functions at a far better you know, performance level. So if you want performance, it's the airplane you go to. Okay. There's nothing even close to Let it. Let me ask you this. Your planes are famous for these big windows that are very that are oval, kind of, and I'm told that you have a grandfather that nobody else can have these big windows. How do you manage to do get that? Well, I think it was a fair amount of, um, you know, copywriting and IP. Um, but as it turns out, they're rather, they're iconic, but they're also very useful. Because on long airplane flights, when you, when you study the physiology of people on those airplanes, what you find is the absence of natural light is rather enervating. So it's a real help for folks to get off that airplane. Because if you think about the people who are buying our airplanes, you know, they're, they're almost always people who have to get off their airplane and, and they're performing a mission. And per, that's particularly true with our corporate customers. Those CEOs have to get off that airplane and they gotta be on. So uh, it's why our airplane is, is the airplane of choice for almost all the Fortune 500 companies. Hey, let's suppose um, I'm on a golf stream and I don't know how to fly a plane and I, I don't. Um, and I'm on one of your better planes, let's say a 650, and all of a sudden the two pilots have heart attacks. Um, <laughs> is it possible that I could go up and be, and they could teach me how to land this thing, or is it that good a plane that I could be talked, I could be talked down, or do you think it's not likely I should have a parachute? <laughs> Well, David, have you ever parachuted at those altitudes? No, You're better off trying to lie on the plane. Um, so, uh, listen, these airplanes are perfectly capable of landing themselves with just a little bit of assistance. Well, that's good to know. You just okay. have to keep your cool. Okay. So you are not going to be competing against... By the way, that is an extremely low probability. And I just want you to understand really? that. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm told, uh, I guess it's true, that you're not supposed to serve the pilots the same food because of food poisoning, so they each have to have different meals. You ever heard of this? You no. Know that? <laughs> you know that? Where you get this? Never heard of that. <laughs> I don't know, maybe true. You know, sometimes the regulations okay. that you just can't believe. Okay. But All right, so um, right now, that business is doing well. Why is it doing so well? Why do so many people want to buy the 450, the 550, the 650? These are your big corporate planes. Why, why are and they're new ones. We have all new airplanes, the 500 and the 600. Frankly, the 600 was just certified two hours ago. Um, and then the 650. So because there is nothing else out there of that, of those, of that, with that capability set and that performance. And performance matters. So if I wanted to buy one, um, can I negotiate? Do you negotiate the prices a little bit or not that much? No, you, you've been there. You know that. <laughs> Listen, we, um, if from a business perspective, in all seriousness, um, 
you know, price is precious. And if you start cutting your price to make sales, you're, you're dead man walking because you don't get that price back. It's a long time coming back. And why have you decided not to go into the business of competing, let's say, with Boeing, of building these larger uh, commercial aircraft? You're really in the business aircraft uh, business. Why have you decided not to get into that business? So if you think about it, why would anyone who is halfway sentient uh, enter a market with two large, successful duopoly players and pretend that they're going to be disruptive? That is not my idea of value creation, and I am driven to create value, make investments in the moment that my shareholders can make a return on. The average person who buys a golf... That's ego, by the way, somebody who does that. The average person who buys a golf stream, is it a male or female? More, I assume more males than females, or not? Um, I think it depends on the buyers. In some instances, it's, it's both. Okay. Um, but I think a preponderance. The of average males. age is roughly in their 50s or something like that? 50s, 60s, and more and 70s. From, more in the United States or outside the United States? Well, we have as a, a large install base. I mean, there's 1,700 um, 450s and 550s alone in our install base, and another almost 400 650s. So primarily in the U.S. market, but also in Europe. Um, we do not have much exposure to China, but we are the largest OEM in China um, in terms of uh, Chinese nationals owning our airplanes. So uh, we, have, uh, we have a pretty broad okay. customer base worldwide. Okay. So would I get a discount if I wanted to buy a new plane by saying I've already bought I think five planes from you, and they're very good, and I, I'm happy to give an advertisement for them. Would that help me get a discount? Your friends and family discount, yes. yeah. Um, <laughs> well, okay. but they are good planes. Chat. They okay. are good planes. All right, let's talk about in the, the marine systems um, mm -hmm. business you have. You make uh, submarines. An average submarine costs a couple billion dollars or something like that? Yes, two. Why are they so expensive? So if you think about the engineering design and construction of a nuclear submarine, it is the most complicated human endeavor on the planet because those submarines are very effective weapon systems that operate in the most hostile environments that man can conceive. Underwater is far more hostile than space. So when you think about the complexity of keeping people alive and combat ready, down at those right. for six month periods at a time, which is their deployments. And by the way, that is hard. I mean, it's just hard. Right. And these, to give you a sense of the size, our smallest subs are the size of football fields. So, and right. if you're as Americans, let me give you an, also a sense, and also how I think about it as an American, they are our competitive advantage in our national security. Every day they help keep us safe. And I believe that. And it's empirically true. They, they, they have men and women in these submarines. They're underwater for a long time. There's a high pregnancy rate there. Is that a surprise? <laughs> no? You know, I, I find it best not to get into uh, gender politics um, okay, on those kinds of, uh, um, but you know, human beings are, the nature of human beings, right. men and women hasn't changed. So I, I suggest, I suspect that over time there'll be some normalization. So these are called uh, nuclear submarines for two reasons. One, they're nuclear powered, but they also carry nuclear weapons. Is that right? They do both? So two, so there are two types, of, if you want the certification in, in submarines, there are two types of submarines. One are the smaller ones, football field size, that, that keep other bad guys away from our shores. It's basically a lot of shore protection, making sure that our shipping lanes are safe. Um, those are not nuclear tipped. They are nuclear run. So they have a little core reactor in them. So again, you're thinking about the safety of a, a reactor that is as far away as you and I are, um, and it's safe. The air, there is a strategic ballistic missile submarine that is part of our nuclear deterrent. Uh, that is, carries, it's both nuclear operated and um, carries nuclear weapon systems. Okay. Let's talk about your land systems business. That makes, basically makes tanks, is that right? Mm -hmm. So why do we need tanks anymore? We don't really seem to use them. World War II, they were maybe good, and maybe in the last Kuwait war, but do we really need tanks that much anymore? 
Those tanks were heavily used in the last skirmishes we had in, uh, and hot wars we had in, in uh, Iraq in particular. But, but if you think about the history of warfare, and, and, and it, wouldn't it be wonderful if that we could all change the fundamental nature of human beings and we could outlaw war, but we're so far from that. So in the absence of that, then you have to ensure that if you do get into a problem, that you win. And the way nations ultimately win is by owning the ground, and the way you own the ground is through tanks. Okay. Is, you know, if you think about warfare and, and ground warfare, it is the most brutal, the most intimate, the most inhumane in many like regards in a, in a of, of all of the forms of warfare. But the tank is a critical how big are those? How many people can fit in one of those tanks? About four, yeah. um, and they're 72 tons. They're heavy. They're hard to kill. They're fast, and they keep a lot of our troops safe. By the way, uh, there was a proposal to take the tanks and maybe the aircraft and kind of have them as a display in Washington, D.C. for a, maybe a Fourth of July kind of thing. Um, do you have any ideas? you ever thought that was a good idea, or do you have any comments on that? I think it's best not to make comments on those things. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll, so, I'll stay in my little foxhole. So let's go to your other, one of your other divisions, which is information systems. Mm -hmm. So that presumably helps on cyber warfare kinds of things. Do you think the United States is vulnerable to cyber attacks, or are we actually better than other countries in doing cyber attacks, and we're actually doing a lot of them now? So to the extent which we are doing cyber attacks ourselves, I don't know, but I can tell you we are under cyber attack. There is a form of war, it's a quiet war that's been ongoing for several years. Um, we, have, we have units that are getting 13 billion hits a month of people trying to penetrate. That is cyber warfare. Okay, so when you talk to members of Congress, presumably you talk to them about weapon systems and so forth, do they really understand all the things you're talking about? I think they do. Um, I think uh, we're lucky, and the folks that I spend a lot of time on are those who focus primarily on national security and defense. And because it's so important, they, they, they get smart on the issues. So oh. it's, uh, it's often a sentient dialogue. Now, what's the biggest challenge of being the CEO of General Dynamics, other than this interview? Uh, what is the biggest <laughs> challenge you, uh, you face? What is your biggest problem? I don't know that it's a problem. I mean, the challenge is always in managing complex organizations and continuing to ensure that you, know, you remain value-driven. I, I think it's increasingly a, an issue for um, public company CEOs that we are required to have the level of for quarterly reporting that we have because that can drive short-termism, and I'm a big believer in investing in the midterm, or in the short-term midterm in order to drive long-term value. So sometimes when, you're hit, when you are held accountable for a quarterly performance, it still takes a fair amount of fortitude to say, I'm going to stay the course. We're going to continue to invest because we're going to create long-term value. So that's, that, that gets to be a little tiresome because I'm not sure how much value added is, is, is derived from quarterly reports. So uh, recently we've uh, had some transition at the Pentagon with the Secretary of Defense and so forth. Uh, there's never been a female Secretary of Defense. Uh, do you think a female could do a better job than a man in that job? And would you consider that job? So I think that the way I look at people is I look at the skills of the people, irrespective of gender, frankly, race, sexual preference. I look at whether you're capable, whether you're thoughtful, you're a contemplative human being, you're a human being of moral character. So I don't much care whether somebody's a female or a male. For me, I've, I think, believe I've served my time. Okay, but if the President of the United States... Oh, please, let's just let it go. <laughs> I think I got a job. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy where I am. <laughs> okay, so you're going to stay at this job for a while. Um, but when you do leave, at some point you might leave, would you ever go back into public service or would you want to do private equity or something important like that? <laughs> so um, I do believe that, that we are often asked to serve. Um, so, you know, I, I found that life is a mercurial enough path um, and a circuitous enough path that we don't always know where it goes. So, you know, I think it's folly to say never, but I am not interested at the moment. Now, your husband is going to the Princeton Theological Seminary and going to become a minister or 
No, he's going to get his PhD in uh, ethics. Ethics, okay. So does he kind of talk to you more about spiritual things and now being, you're running an aerospace defense company, is that a very spiritual thing or is he giving you more spiritual uh, bearing than you had before? Well, I think, you know, our, our own personal spirituality is such a private journey um, that I personally don't believe is informed by too many people on the outside. But what he does do is he's in a, in a, in a field that has stretched me intellectually. I mean, I gotta go look up words he's using. Um, so it's been kind of, you know, fun and exciting at this point in our lives to have something that's so, you know, so different from the normal path. When you're not running General Dynamics, uh, what are your outside activities? I know you have three children and three grandchildren. Yes. And what do your grandchildren call you? CEO so, or something? Yeah. <laughs> Because that's what I expect, right? Um, no. Um, so funnily enough, my oldest grandson came up with the word baka, um, which is Serbian for grandmother. So where he came up with that, I don't know. Nobody around him speaks Serbian. It was just, you know, I think it was, you know, fortuitous. So what do you do with outside activities? Do you have any sports you're doing? Or, you know, any philanthropic things you're most interested in? Or are you basically spending most of your time with your, your, your job? It's job, it's family, but I also think that for so many years that I was working, raising my children, that I didn't have any time, no time to give back to the community. So I do spend a fair amount of time on things that I think are important to, to our community at all different levels, important to our military, our military spouses, um, okay. our, our nation, and, 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 some, and, and our, I'm, I'm on the board, I'm the board, uh, chairman of the board of Ford's Theater, and I'm a big believer in, in continuing to teach the values that Lincoln taught us all of civility, of patriotism, of honor, of forgiveness. So uh, Jim Crown, who's on your board, um, couldn't be here because of a personal reason beyond his control, but how would you assess his performance as a board member? <laughs> <laughs> okay, just to set the context here, not only is on my board, he is my lead director and our lead shareholder. Um, so. All right, so that'll be an easy question to answer. So, so he's a very he, he, he he's a he's a very thoughtful businessman, a very good partner. Um, I uh, appreciate his wise counsel. Um, okay. All right, so I guess... And you're... I'll be seeing you out back later. Okay. <laughs> I guess you'll give him an A-plus as a director. He's a very good director. Okay. So we have time for some questions. We have a few minutes. Anybody have a question for Phoebe? Um, let's see. Right here. Just stand up and give your name, if you would, and ask a question. Thank you. Phoebe, thank you. Thank you both. Melinda Delmonico from Golden, Colorado. I'm, I'm just curious, when you talk about your, your role as CEO... Personally, what have you, what do you, what do you walk away with, with with this job? What have you learned for yourself and and uh, in this role as CEO for such a large company? Well, I think I've learned a lot of technical things that I don't know that particularly put you in good stead, but I think it has enhanced what I thought the, you know, my character traits that I brought into the job were, and I think that's a fair amount of compassion. I've learned that actually under pressure I can maintain that compassion, that clarity of thought. Um, sometimes when you're bombarded by a lot, and this isn't always pleasant, uh, a lot of ugliness that you can have to have, continue to be strong, continue to be thoughtful, um, have the courage, you have good convictions, and, and you just have to be tough as nails. Um, so I think that that's an affirmation of, I will walk away knowing that at least if I've done nothing else, that I have been true to myself. By the way, as you know, you're obviously well known as the CEO of this company. You've risen to the top. Do you feel any discrimination as a woman any longer, or you see it in other parts of your you life? Well, I looked at discrimination as the last possible place. If I had problems in the work for, in the workplace, and we all do during our careers, the first thing I do is hold the mirror up to myself and say, "Is there something I'm doing?" And then I'd say, "Is there some?" other problem this other person has. And the last place I'd go was that he's a sexist. There were sexists, and there were folks and fellas who just didn't much care for me because I was a woman and, and, the thought was, and were horrified at the thought of having to work for me. Um, but they, were, they would no longer be with us. And so... Um, okay. 
So, you know, look, again, because I have this very, um, I, the way I see our people is um, we're all people. And, um, and I treat the men and the women all the same. And Who I are better employees, the men or the women? You know, you keep looking for these distinctions. While I do believe there are fundamental distinctions between men and women, I think as professionals and executives, okay. there really aren't. Okay, back, back here and then here. First here and then there. And then there. Okay? Uh, Wynne Churchill. Uh, when we speak about uh, the moral compass and defense, uh, uh, we haven't heard the word deterrence. Isn't deterrence a big part of the ethics of this? I believe that it is. It's part of our policy. You know, we prepare and we arm not, not, not to shoot in anger, but to protect our nation and be sufficiently strong that people are afraid of messing with us. That's the beauty of deterrence. You build up a strong enough military that folks don't want to take you on. Um, it doesn't always work, and when it doesn't, um, that's when we have to act. But I think deterrence is a, is a big part of it. You know, I, I, I sometimes think in a world of great complexity, it, it, it helps to go to revert back to simple values. And I do believe that there are good people in the world and evil people. I believe there are good systems of government and bad systems of government that oppress people, oppress individuals, oppress freedom of speech, and ultimately destroy the human spirit. I believe it's the job of Americans to ensure that we never have that in this country, that we, ha that we never get that imposed by an outside force or even internal force, and that we help our allies to protect against that. I mean, there is such a thing as good and evil. Hey, right here. My question, There's a, Mike, get the mic, please. My question is, with the complexity of your business, how fast and how much is the need for data growing? So in my job, what you have to ensure is that data doesn't inf interfere with your ability to discern the important facts upon which you have to make a decision. So data drives a lot of the independent operations in a company. For example, all of Gulfstream airplanes are data driven so that we understand, we use, we use artificial intelligence to be predictive about um, uh, routine maintenance. That's why we have the highest um, reliability by far in the industry. But for me, I need to make sure that the vast amount of information coming my way is not so great that I can't discern what is important from all the noise. That's, that takes time. That's a skill set. Um, you can get it wrong. I spend a lot of time thinking about what's important here. In the thousands of you know, tennis balls that are coming my way, what's important? OK, now I got it. Now I know what to focus on. And once I have that clarity, then I can set the stroke for the rest of the team. It's a good question, because I spent a lot of time thinking about through the, all the noise, you know, how do you figure out in the fog of war what, what you got to think about? Okay, um, right here. Barbara Fergus from Ohio. Uh, we're in a time of mergers and acquisitions. Do you see Raytheon doing any of that integrating with another company in the not too distant future? So typically, um, I know both CEOs, uh, but typically I don't comment on those kinds of uh, mergers and acquisitions. But I will tell you that, that um, I, I think that the, the top big guys, and these are the, you know, the, the big primes, um, are pretty stable. I don't know how much more consolidation that you really can or need to have. You needed to have it at one point. but. Uh, so this is interesting. We'll follow it. Um, and I wish them well. I never were you surprised? Well, yeah. I think a lot of people were. OK. All right. Um, other right here. Question? Hi, my name is Gian Favors. Um, I'm a former CIA uh, case officer uh, who left government a few years ago to go back to law school. And I'm now practicing law at uh, Wachtell Lipton in New York City. My question for you is, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about your transition from the public sector to the private sector, and maybe compare and contrast what you found most rewarding when you were working in government and what you now do in the private sector. So when you're working in the government, or at least the positions that I had, you're very close to the mission 
that I've always believed in, and that is the protection of this nation. Um, I still work to that end and I, in my company, but it is one step removed. So there is an emotional gratification uh, that you can get from public service um, that I think is, is, is very, very important. Um, and, and for me, it has fed a lot of the, it gave me the energy to put in the kind of hours and work that you do at the time. Um, but making that transition can be difficult because, um, but ultimately, it, it's difficult in the short term because there's a different pace of work in, in business. Um, and frankly, in business, you have a lot more control. So it, it, it's a little bit easier. It's easier to, to be at the senior levels of business than it is in government because you have so very few um, levers at your control. You can't fire anybody. You're, a, you're, you're dependent on somebody else to give you a budget. That's the U.S. Congress. Um, you ha and, and, and you can't, and you have to coordinate with many, many different, the complexity of coordinating with many, many different interests is far greater than what I have to do. Not that what we do is simple, but that's... Okay, so let's suppose somebody is a young Phoebe Novakovic graduating from Smith today. Would you recommend that a woman or a man graduating from uh, any college should go into the aerospace defense business because it's exciting, profitable, rewarding, or would you say go into something else? I think it's a great business. Um, and we have a lot of young kids coming to work because they do want to serve their country. And the role of patriotism in all of our companies, um, it, it's a big part of it. Uh, I've, in fact, I've hired a lot of kids that I know and they enjoy it. You know, again, it's, you know, it's really who you work with, too, and as long as you've got a functional organization and people you know, are, are aligned and they're transparent and they trust each other, right. you know, it can so be a lot of fun, but I recommend the industry. If you were looking back on your career, when you came in 2001 to General Dynamics and you were promoted to be the CEO in 2013, what would you say is the, the uh, element that propelled you forward? Was working harder, being smarter, being more knowledgeable about the defense business. What was the one attribute that you think enabled you to rise from a modest position to a senior position? I think it was a combination of probably all those things, but at the end of the day, it was judgment. Um, I rely heavily on my judgment, and I'm, that is where I am most confident. And I make mistakes, but I, um, you know, what is judgment? If you think about defining it, but we all know what it is, and um, I've tended to have superior judgment. So when you tell your children... And by the way, a mental toughness. Um, well, when you tell your children uh, to do something, can you say, I have superior judgment, and... No, that case, you just say, I told you so, do it. Okay. <laughs> all right, okay. Uh, we have time for one more question, I think, right here. Or, or two more questions, this one, and then the gentleman here. So two more questions, then we're out of time, really. Hi, Julie Storer, I'm from Seattle. Your um, company is at the nexus of science and technology and design, engineering, and all of those fields that are dependent on STEM education. So I'd love it if you'd give us your opinion on the role of companies like yours in driving STEM education in the US, and particularly in communities of less um, opportunity and any efforts that you have there? So I think that's good for us as I think promoting STEM, promoting childhood education across the board is good for our, our company. It's good for our nation and it's good for our industry. Um, I'm also a big believer that um, when you are a company like a company like we are, that you have to serve your local community. And we have facilities in, in a number of, of economically underprivileged uh, areas, and we end up being extraordinarily involved in, in, in largely a lot of, on education, because if you can get the kids, you have a hope for the future. Well, what did you major in in, in uh, college? Mm. Uh, <laughs> government and uh, religion and English and history. It was sort of a 
joint major. I just took whatever series of classes and it turned out to be that that was You had to do it all over again. Would you have been a STEM major or not? Oh, heck no. Um, no, you know, because what I, learned in, what I learned in that liberal arts degree was I learned how to think and I learned how to write and how to communicate. And those have been superb skills for me. Final question, gentleman right here. Uh, can you tell us the difference in the, the culture of your company versus the others in your industry? The culture? The culture, culture. of your company Cultural versus the, your competitors. Um, I, can, I think I'm most comfortable talking about my own. It's what I know most intimately. And um, I don't really have firsthand knowledge of how other folks think about their business. Uh, so I've tried to be pretty transparent with you about how I see my business and the culture of that, but I, uh, I think I'm safest and, and most accurate in talking about what I know. Okay, but well, do you have recruit more people from Lockheed Martin or they recruit more people from you? <laughs> so, well, we can share on occasion. Um, we, uh, we have no problem in hiring people. Okay, so the final question, let me ask the final question. So when you look back on your life, what is it that you're most proud of having achieved? Um, your family, your professional success, your work in government, what do you think is your greatest uh, achievement and what do you would like to see as your legacy? So even as if those of you are, as parents, isn't our greatest achievement when we raise moral children, children of good character? I did that. Um, I'm the most proud of that. Okay. Thank you very much. And um, I, if I wanted to buy a stock that was also going to go up continuously, I would be, General Dynamics would be a good company to buy in the future, you think? Oh, I know so. Okay. And if we had another hour, I would talk to you about my business and why it is a good investment at the moment. All right. Thank you very much.